Hey everyone, so today we're getting around to building up another Cannondale. I picked this one up off a friend, and I don't think it makes too much sense to have two pretty similar Cannondales, so this is replacing the other one that I've built up. The premise behind this bike is to build up a 26 inch fixed gear bike, but the problem is this has vertical dropouts, so you can run like a magic ratio, but then you can't really adjust the chain slack. Um, when the chain does wear out a bit and slackens off. So to get around that, I'm trying out the Velo Orange Eccentric Bottom Bracket Converter. This bolts up to any regular 68 and 73 millimeter shells. And then you use a 24 millimeter crank, so just regular Shimano Helotec 2 or something similar, um, through that hole. And then yeah, bolt it all together and you have about six millimeters of adjustment to take out the chain slack. As well as that, we're gonna be installing some cool purple parts. So this is a tangent 46 tooth chain ring and some old Coda cannon to lever brakes. So pretty cool that I found some Coda brakes for the Cannondale, come in this nice purple. So, so first things first, we gotta get the bottom bracket out. Um, you should really do this at the start of the build anyway rather than getting down the line finding that the bottom bracket or the seat post or the stem is stuck or something. Um, sometimes you can get away with it, but considering this build is sort of based around the whole bottom bracket converter um, situation, it's probably a good idea to get that out before we go ahead with the build and tidy up the frame and everything like that. Um, the bottom bracket does feel quite notchy. Um, yeah, so let's go. So really what we're going to need is leverage. So normally bolting the tool to the bottom bracket, then either using a long bar or actually using the frame as its own leverage works pretty good. So you can throw the tool in a vise if you've got a bench vise and then do it that way. Um, otherwise a mate with a long bar or just standing and jumping on it. Um, yeah. Easy. And the other side, it's pretty awkward trying to. And the other side. So just like my other Cannondale, this one has a few paint scratches. We're just going to be using some Autosol metal polish to polish this up, just to give it a bit of a nicer finish. You can use some nail polish or something to fill in smaller paint chips, but I quite like the beaten up look, and I'm just going to sort of pretty it up a little bit. Just some Autosol does a really good job at polishing raw alloy. If this was a steel bike, I'd probably just leave it raw or clear coat it. But because this is alloy, it's quite a bit easier to polish. So I just use some auto salt on it. Even without a Dremel, alloy is pretty easy to polish. And then I just leave it as is. Auto salt does a really good job at protecting against oxidizing in the future. Um, I've clear coated cranks. I've just left auto salt like raw polished cranks before, and. From now on, I'm just going to leave it raw auto sole because it just works out better. You can just repolish it. Uh, clay coat doesn't really stick to polished parts that well, especially like high wear items like cranks and stuff. So now I just leave it raw auto sole. So some of the paint had a few little scuffs and stuff. Just some regular paint polish did a really good job at cleaning up some of it, but others not so much. You can see here on the right seat stay, I've polished it, and on the left, it's still quite dull. So that is the non-polished part. So it brings up the paint really nicely. You've got to be careful though. 
if there's no clear coat left on the paint. Polishing can sort of wear through the color. So just do it in like a test spot first and then go from there. And just disassembling the bike from here, cleaning up the headset and stuff. So it's not in the worst condition. It didn't feel notchy or anything. It didn't have those indexing marks that some of the older headsets can get. Sort of if the headset is just stuck in one place over time. So there's just a smooth wear ring around most of the bearing races. So it's pretty well okay to keep riding. There was this oxidizing here that I was a little bit wary about. I'm just I decided to peel it off just in case there was a crack here underneath. And because the bike, it has a bunch of scratches elsewhere, so I don't mind peeling off the little bit of extra just to make sure that it's structurally sound. So one of the tricks to getting off surface rust on chromed parts is by using some tin foil or aluminium foil and then basically just rubbing it on. You can use WD-40 or water just to sort of lubricate it. I think the theory behind this is that the aluminium foil can't really scratch the chrome because it's too soft. Um, I could be wrong about that, but either way, it does a lot better than like Brillo pads or something like that because it doesn't really scratch it. You can see some scratches here, but that's sort of just from wear and tear. It's not from the, the foil itself. So after that, just to add a little bit more brightness, I go over it with some autosol. You can see in the shot here that on the bottom portion, it's been hit with autosol. On the top, it's still a bit dull from before autosol. I'm just cleaning up the bearings. You can pop out like each individual thing uh, or just buy new bearings. But they say it's not really recommended because the bearings sort of wear to the surfaces. So you should replace the whole thing at once, but it's still going to be doing the steering things perfectly fine. So just going to service this one and put it all back together. Putting in fresh grease. This isn't a bike specific product, but it's an automotive wheelbearing grease and it's pretty much the same viscosity that I've seen of similar bike products, but it's a damn sight cheaper. And it does a really good job at repelling water and stuff. I've used it for a few years now and it's treated me really good. And yeah, it's a lot cheaper than buying like a park tool or similar product specifically for bikes. And you can just get it at the auto parts store. So this is from Super Cheap Auto if you're from New Zealand or Australia. Um, I think the Penrite and the Gulf, well, Gulf Western is pretty similar. I've used both and they seem about the same. Just taking out that nub. I really hate that nub. It just damages so many serotube threads. To the top securing nut. It had been hit with some black spray paint at some point. I cleaned it off just with some paint stripper. I tried some um, tips first, but it didn't quite get it off. So paint stripper did the trick. Then I hit that with some auto sole as well and tied it up really nicely. So I used this toothbrush, you might have seen me use it before, I used a toothbrush to sort of smear the grease further down into like steer tubes and seat tubes. Just gets the grease down there a bit better than what I can do with my finger. So this handlebar I got from Blue Lug in Japan. This is a Nitto B802 AAF, I think the model number is. They do come in a high rise version, which it's a bit taller and has a bit more back sweep I think. But this is the, oh, and it, I think the other one is a bit wider as well. But this isn't that one. It's a little bit narrower, but does a really good job. I think these are based on like a die comp or die tech brake. But it's really cool because they have individual spring adjustment. So pretty cool for a cantilever brake. So each post I can adjust the spring tension on so I can dial them in really good. I just quickly tidied up some of the bolts with autosol and they cleaned up pretty well actually. Over onto the whole base of the build, 
the Bell Orange Eccentric Bottom Bracket. This is it here. Pretty simple, really. Here's the instructions if you want to check them out. Basically, it installs like a regular external bottom bracket, and then there's three grub screws either side of the bottom bracket shell, and that adjusts the eccentric position, and that's meant to hold the cranks in place. So in the instructions here, it says to make sure there's no grease in the BB shell. I don't know if that's a typo, or if for some reason they don't want you to put grease in here. Um, but I don't want this converter stuck inside my frame, so I'm going to be using grease. I should mention that Velar Orange doesn't recommend this for fixed gear use. So whether there's some additional forces um, with fixed gear use or not, that's sort of up for debate. I think maybe like the fixed gear freestyle and the trick track sort of crowd might put a bit more force and sort of rapid back and forth motions on the bike but I'm about 95 kilograms and I wouldn't say I'm too harsh of a user, but I will be doing some skids and stuff with the setup and testing it and seeing how it goes. They say it can handle off-road single speed use, so I can't imagine it would be too different from that, like mashing up hills and stuff, but we're gonna find out and see how it goes. So they give you this tool for installation and this is really similar to a track lockering tool I actually think that the other end is designed for that. I didn't actually test it on one of my track lock rings. So two millimeter Allen key and three grub screws to hold the tension. Um, I don't know how this is gonna go there are some other bottom bracket or eccentric bottom bracket conversion kits out there and they use a similar style. There's another one that uses sort of a clamp that's just one pinch bolt. So I don't know if this is going to be better with the three grub screws or not, um, but we're going to see how it goes. Worst comes to worst, um, we end up busting some bearings and then we can, I guess we can rebuild it. Haven't, don't quote me on that though because I haven't pulled it apart. But um, yeah, we might be, might be rebuilding it with some new bearings and then if that does fail, I'm going to use it as like a Nexus setup. So I've got a bit of a backup plan if the fixed gear system doesn't work with this. So putting the chain ring on now, we'll be using it on the inner position. This just works best for the chain line of the bike with the fixed gear rear wheel. So these are just regular Shimano Dior XT Holotech 2 cranks. There's quite a few cranks out there that have 24mm axles, so but these are just ones that I had sitting around. So the eccentric kit comes with these washers. These are spindle washers, um, regularly with a Holotech 2 or external bottom bracket shell, you'll use bottom bracket spacers, but this time I'm going to be using some spindle washers. This is just to get the cranks in the right position. So I just went back and forth a couple of times, installing and removing them until they're about even either side. So you can see here I'm adjusting just the non-drive side. This is just so I can make sure that the chain ring is in the correct position. So if you adjust <laughs> one side and not the other, then the crank's gonna be sitting at an angle and then the chain ring's not gonna be aligned right. So you gotta make sure that you've got them in the right position. Because it's a hexagon, you can actually line it up pretty easily. I just, just for reference, I colored um, two of the symbols just so that I know which is the right ones to line up. I think it would be cool if they had like a tool for the alignment. So what I did was I went underneath the bottom bracket shell and I lined that up with a straight edge and just made sure that they're in the right position that way. 
I think they could have had a tool that pushed into the holes that the installation tool clips into and then that could have aligned it um, I think that would have been a nice little addition and it would have been pretty simple um, but it didn't come with like a alignment tool so you just have to sort of eyeball it or well, yeah I used a straight edge and did a pretty good job so just installing the cranks now making sure they have enough preload but not too much so this is my old 26 inch fixed gear setup this is just a freewheel hub with a bolt-on disc cog. Yeah, it's just an old 18 tooth one. They come in a bunch of different sizes. I know Problem Solvers makes them too. We're going to be using this Mavic Crossride front wheel. It's a pretty popular option to use a front wheel. That way it's a little bit wider because it doesn't have the option for, you know, a regular free hub or anything on that side. So it doesn't have to be skinnier to make a way for that. And then you would basically just use a solid axle through that, but you use the factory cones and everything. I got pretty lucky with this. This is the first um, hub that I tried. And this has sealed bearings, but it doesn't have like a proprietary axle or anything. It's just a regular straight through axle. So I can just take off these cone nuts and everything and then chuck those onto the solid axle. And then basically just use some axle nuts on the end of that and that should hold it all together. So it is pretty common to use regular Shimano front hubs. As long as it's a disc hub, you can use front or rear. Um, and then a lot of the Shimano ones have pretty common thread pitches, so you can get solid axles to match for those. To match for those. Um, and then you just disassemble the hub basically, and then throw the nuts and cone nuts and everything onto the solid axle. So with a front hub, you will have to find some spaces and stuff to make sure that the axle and wheel is spaced properly. You might have to dish the rim, but most rims have a couple of millimeters of adjustment that way. Um, as, I guess as long as your nipples aren't maxed out, then you should be alright. So popping the axle in now, and then putting it into the frame. So, and then I go behind the bike and sort of line up where the chain ring will match up with the cog. You can do some measurements based on the center of the frame and then line that up with the rear cog and that will give you a more accurate reading. So I will have to dish the wheel, so I'm going to make sure that the nipples are lubricated. This is about how many spaces I'll need to make up the difference between the hub and the frame. So I do mess around with the positioning and stuff of them, but for now I'm just going to dish the wheel over a little bit and then play around with the spaces. So because they're aero spokes, I don't have the tool for that. Um, so I'm just using a adjustable crescent and then dishing the wheel over. So basically just going two full rotations counterclockwise on the drive side spokes. And then I'll be going two full rotations clockwise on the non-drive side spokes. And that will shift it over a little bit to the left. I did have one casualty though. Going by the damage of the spoke, someone had tried to, I'm guessing someone had tried to adjust uh, spoke tension without holding the aero blade in position because it was twisted. And when I tried to adjust the spoke, um, the twist wouldn't come out. So it's been like that for a long time. But luckily I had a rear Mavic cross ride and the spokes were, for some reason, they were the same length. Um, which I, So I just got really lucky with that. So now I just have one silver spoke in, in that wheel. And 18. So just like regular disc brake rotors, I will be using a little bit of Loctite on the bolts. And just screwing them all in. So the ratio I'm using on this bike is 46-18 seems to work pretty good for the terrain around me but this is sort of like a commuting gear if I was going to be riding off-road I'd definitely go a bit lower so the tires we're using are Maxxis hookworms I used these on the other Kendall and I really like them they're heavy but they roll nicely and they resist a lot of punches I haven't had a puncture in these which is amazing because I've even had punches in like 12 Marathon Pluses 
and pretty much every other tire you can think of. I'm yet to try some tennis armor, but I think that'll be the next step. Because, yeah, I just there's just no way for me to prevent punches with all the glass and stuff around in Auckland at the moment. So just checking out the chain lane now. Looks pretty good. The chain should be able to take out that amount of difference. Now, because we're going to be running just a single front brake, I don't need these brake posts, so I decided just to take them out. It'll make it a little bit cleaner looking from the side. Not too much though, because it's still going to have these nubs there left over. And then I thought, this kind of looks like a pressed to valve cap would fit in here. I wasn't going to fill it with anything, because I don't mind too much about having some water ingress, but I thought I might as well put something there. And sure enough, the pressed up valve cap screwed in there quite nicely. I just chopped it down a little bit and put a slot in there for a flathead screwdriver. That'll just prevent water sitting in there over time. Because after a long time, water could damage the alloy. Definitely. So this is kind of the moment of truth. The bottom bracket adapter has, I think it's about six millimeters or something of adjustment to take up the chain slack. And I don't know if that's going to be enough with this gearing. You can get it pretty close, like with a magic ratio or something. And then six millimeters will be plenty for that. But sometimes you need a little bit of extra um, movement in the rear wheel to take up that. Oh, the chain's too short. <laughs> okay. Bear with me, bear with me. Up back as it goes, or... Further. Oh yeah, that. Oh yeah. <laughs> so. And fuck. Okay. I'm gonna scuff the chain ring up. Take it off the cog. Put it on the chain ring. Get over it. See, this is... <laughs> okay. okay, we got slack. Wait, where's the... Yeah, that's too tight, that's too tight. A little bit, a little bit of slack, maybe about there. <laughs> Damn, that's actually, so that's quite a bit of, how do we adjust it? So that's quite a bit of chain tension then, if it goes like slack. I thought back. Dang, yeah. That's that's quite a bit of chain tension from slack to tight. Like that's too tight. Far out. So that that's probably about how much slack I'd have, maybe a little bit more. And then Dang. That's crazy. So whether these big chunky hookworms are going to be too much force along with me, I'm pretty heavy. Um, we're just going to find out. And if it doesn't work, I can use this adapter on a different bike. I think it'd be cool to convert something to like a Nexus drive or something with it, if the fixed gear doesn't work out. So we're just going to get the so we're just going to get the chain tension right and then lock it in place. Right about there. So this one needs to be around about there. I 
thought I thought this bolt here. So this is easier to see from underneath the bottom bracket, um, especially with the lighting. So you can see here, just trying to get them aligned. in there. There you go. So that Brake pads all lined up. So I sort of skipped over the last few bits of this bike, um, but this is basically how you adjust the spring tension of the front brake, these old Coda brakes. Really cool that you can adjust spring tension either side because that's not too common of cantilever brakes. There are some that you can do it both sides, but um, the old ones, yeah, not as common. I also put a front basket on the bike. I really like using a basket for commuting. This is a Wald 137. It's a really good size and it can fit, you know, my shoes and some clothes and stuff and regular tools for commuting and it just attaches to the eyelets on the factory fork, which is really handy. So yeah, just going to take it for a ride now, and then I'll tell you my thoughts on the conversion and stuff a bit later in the video.
the brake. It's the front brake. Get caught. This is an outdoor velodrome that's at Olympic Park in Yulin. We only have a couple of outdoor velodromes in Auckland and there's been talks that they're going to either take this one away or repurpose the area into something else. They've come out with a survey which will sort of help decide its fate. Um, I'll leave that in a link in the description below. Further German bike racing. It's pretty much like bike NASCAR where you just only turn left and there's like a whole bunch of bullshit rules. <laughs> there's some birds off to my left. I don't know, I'd be sad to see this car. I don't use it every week but it's really nice just to use. Like if I've got an extra bit of energy or something on the commute, I just go zoop zoop zoop.
So how did it go? Did it survive? How long have you ridden for? Have you gone up any steep hills? Um, you saw me do some skids and stuff. I'm not amazing at doing skids. I do have a front brake, so during some of the long descents and stuff, I do grab the brake a little bit. Uh, but I have done some skip stops and like resisting braking and that sort of stuff. And the bottom bracket is held in place. I haven't had it um, lose chain tension or anything at any point. I've been checking the bolts and stuff. I did put some blue Loctite on the grub screws because I just don't really trust them. <laughs> They're so small. But it's been holding up great and I've done over 100 kilometers on it now. And that's been commuting Ks. So, you know, elevation gain and descent and everything as well. My commute seems to be about 180 meters elevation, according to Strava. And that's over about 18 kilometers each way. If it does fail in the future, I know the trick stuff, Eccentrica, bottom bracket, um, Robbie road one, and that busted in 33 kilometers, riding fixed, I think was the, the distance. So like, um, it sort of exploded outwards and just ruined the bearings. But this one's been going good for me. If I do damage it or it destroys itself in the future, I'll pin a comment down below and, <laughs> and tell people and let you know whenabouts it died. But for now it's going great. I'm really enjoying it. And just to have a Cannondale fixed gear bike with the chain tension that I can adjust. So when the chain wears out, I can adjust that in the future. That's really cool to me. Um, and it's so much cheaper than a Cannondale track. And I can have 2.5 inch wide tires, which, which is just amazing to me. So the conversion has been working fixed for me, although they don't really recommend it, but it's been going good for me, so yeah, I'm the guinea pig, it's going okay. <laughs> Thanks for checking the video out. If you have any questions, leave them down below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And I'll see you in the next one. I've got a couple of other fixed gear bikes, but more regular ones coming up. But I think the next one is going to be another old retro mountain bike. And yeah, stay tuned and I'll see you soon. Bye.